Thank you once again for joining me on the Waters and Stanton video channel. Over the past year I've had a number of inquiries about line isolators. Where should I put the line isolator? Should I put it up at your feed point? Should I put it down at the transceiver end? And how do I make a line isolator? And all these questions come in different forms, but what I'm going to try and do in this video is to answer all the various questions by covering the requirements of a line isolator, why you need one, how you can make one, and where you should put it. So let's discuss line isolators. I've been licensed now for 64 years, and you know I spent a good part of my ham radio life without using a line isolator, without worrying about a line isolator. It's only in recent years that I've started to use a line isolator. So it does prove the point that a line isolator is not the be all and end all of ham radio. Yes, there are some benefits and I'll cover those uh, shortly. But in actual fact, you don't need a line isolator to get on the air. You can make yourself a simple wire dipole, you can connect the coax to it, the braid goes to one side, the inner conductor goes to the other side, you can connect that cable to your transceiver, and the chances are you'll enjoy some good contacts. So you might ask, quite rightly so, why, if that's the case, do I need a line isolator? Well, in short, a line isolator makes life somewhat easier. And it also helps to cure one or two problems. So let's take a look at what a line isolator can do for your station. A line isolator, if it's situated at the feed point to the antenna, for example, a dipole, then it not only acts as a line isolator, but it also acts as a one-to-one -one ballon, which is quite convenient. A line isolator can also cancel out what is known as common mode currents. You may have heard of that common mode currents, although you may not fully understand how they occur. I'll cover that very shortly. You can also reduce the VSWR errors. When common mode currents flow on the outside of a coax, it can also affect the accuracy of the VSWR readings. And finally, the outside of the coax also picks up quite a lot of noise because the coax is basically vertically polarised, so it's very uh, sensitive uh, to noise. And that noise can appear in your receiver. Let's first of all, in a simple way, try and understand how common mode currents occur. If we connect a coax cable to a dipole, the inner conductor goes to one side and the sheathing goes to the other side. Now, the RF current travelling up the centre of the coax flows very easily into the one side of the dipole because that dipole's resonant. The 50 ohm coax is a transmission line and it's looking for a low impedance. The dipole typically has an impedance roughly of 70 to 40 ohms depending on how high it is above the ground, but it's a low impedance. So the inner conductor is quite happy with delivering current into that side of the dipole. And really and truly, on the other side of the dipole, the sheathing side, that delivers a fair amount of power into the other side of the dipole. Again, that dipole is resonant. That uh, quarter wave length of wire on the side of the dipole connected to the sheathing is resonant. And the whole transmission line is geared up to work into a low impedance. So again, it sees a low impedance on both sides. But there is a measure of current that does flow down the outer side of the sheathing. Not a lot, because that sheathing, generally speaking, is a high impedance, it's reactive, and the, the component of that sheathing will vary as you change frequency. So if you're multi-banding, say on 40, 20, 15 and 10, that impedance on the sheathing will change quite dramatically. But generally speaking, it is a relatively high impedance and therefore not much current flows down it. But a measure of the current does, and that's what we're concerned about. Now let me explain. The sheathing of the coax 
really forms two conductors. The inside of the sheathing is one conductor and the outside of the sheathing is another conductor. And when I say sheathing, I'm talking about the metal woven sheathing, not the plastic coating, of course. Uh, the reason being that RF travels on the surface of a conductor and the sheathing effectively is two conductors. We've got the inside and the outside. The inside is fine. That forms part of the transmission line, but it's the outside of the sheathing which forms a third conductor in effect and current travels down that. Now, if we insert an RF choke formed by winding the coax into a coil of several turns, then what actually happens, it starts to choke off the RF traveling on the outside of the sheathing. It doesn't have any effect on the RF on the inside of the coax, but the RF traveling down the outside of the sheathing is choked off. That means to say that maximum current flows into both sides of the dipole, it equalizes the currents, and therefore it acts as a form of ballon, as well as a choke. Now, the only problem with an air-wound choke is that it tends to be narrow-banded. It becomes resonant. It's got a very um, sort of a very definite resonant point where it is chokes off very, very effectively indeed. But either side falls off quite rapidly. So you might have a, uh, a line isolator which is formed by winding several turns of coax, and it may work very well on 20 meters, but very rapidly its effect. Uh, tails off and so on 40 meters it's probably not nearly as good and likewise on 10 meters so there is one way to overcome that and that is to wind the coax around a toroid core a ferrite toroid core now there's a very interesting youtube um, article or video which uh, i'll put a link to below this um, uh, this video and it explains how RF chokes work and how effective they are and how change in the spacing between the windings is uh, important and the type of ferrite material that is uh, very good for uh, line isolators or RF chokes because a line isolator basically is an RF choke. And uh, in this particular video, they use uh, a type 43 material. Uh, it's a material I, I advocate as well. I use 240-4 43 ferrite cores and they seem to be optimized particularly for line isolators. Now RG213 is widely used both for VHF and for HF. It's not so good for VHF really but for HF it's it's fine. I use RG213. Um, if you're looking for an all-round cable that's for uh, HF and VHF then LMR400 is the way to go. And I did a, um, a video very, very recently about coax losses and the coax loss on uh, LMR400 is extremely low and it works very well even up into VHF and UHF areas. So it's worth possibly spending a bit more money on LMR400. Either way, you can't use RG213 or LMR400 to create a line isolator by winding it around a ferret core because it's just too thick. And the way to resolve that is to use RG58. Now RG58 is a much thinner coax and you can wind that round a ferret core quite easily. And before you hold your hands up in horror, RG58 has got a very low loss if you're talking about a short length of it. Uh, even up to 30 megahertz, it's, it's just a fraction of a dB. We're only talking about a, a metre or so of RG58 to wind your line isolator. So the loss is really of no consequence. As regards power handling, it will handle 500 watts. I have used a line isolator for the last two years and uh, if I run 500 watts into it, there's no problem. So, provided you're not run, running really high power, RG58 is fine. So let's now look at how we can make a simple line isolator. I'm going to use RG58 because that means I can wind it on a ferrite core and the line isolator can be slotted in anywhere I like. I wound nine turns of RG58 onto a ferrite core and then attached a PL259 plug at either end. In fact, at one end I needed a socket and I simply attached a barrel joiner which converts a plug effectively into a socket. By the way, if you struggle to put on PL259 plugs, we now stock some compression plugs, which I've used. And let me just show you briefly the structure of the compression plugs that we do. 
On the right we've got the outer barrel, then we've got a washer and then we've got this rubber grommet which when compressed and tightened grips the cable. We then cut the braiding back, apply this captive piece and push it hard up against the braiding. Then just bear the centre and uh, pass the whole assembly into the plug and then solder the end tip as you would normally do. The point is that it's very easy to assemble. The only soldering is soldering the centre pin. And the, the downside of PL25 done plugs has always been the braid. How to actually um, make sure you get good contact with the braid. Well, this, this plug assembly achieves it. And we've got those in stock. And I'll try and remember to put a link below this video so that if you want to order them and uh, try them out. I think you'll find them very easy to use. And uh, it makes uh, much better... Um, assembly than the old PL259 plugs which are always a little bit of a hit and miss arrangement. <coughs> now finally let's talk about where you actually place the line isolator. I tend to employ the belt and braces principle. I always in, have a, a line isolator at the feed point so if you've got a dipole I have a line isolator right at the point where the coax connects to the antenna. If I have a vertical Again, I have a line isolator exactly where the coax meets the base of the vertical antenna. If I've got a 5RV or a doublet, I place the line isolator at the point where the coax meets the balanced line. Now, as I've said before, uh, the beauty of this line isolator is that uh, the power rating is really the power rating of the coax. And there is no loss at all. Um, it differs from a, a conventional ballon because uh, the internal uh, um, transmission line is not interrupted at all. It's a direct connection to the antenna. You could, of course, build the whole assembly into a box. This is a box I got from RS Components, and this particular box has got an end fed halfway 49 to 1 unannin. But you get the idea. You could put it into a box to make it a neater and perhaps a smarter assembly. Now, what about the other end of the coax where it meets the transceiver in the radio shack well i also apply a line isolator then i'll tell you for why first of all although the line isolator at the feed point will choke off the common mode currents there is still rf then um, picked up again by the outer sheet of the coax because the outer sheet of the coax is very close to your transmitting antenna. So again, although you've choked off the common mode current, you haven't stopped RF traveling back down the outside of the coax that is directly um, picked up by the outer sheath in being so close in proximity to the transmitting antenna. Also, as I said, I think in the uh, beginning of this video, that a lot of noise can be picked up on the outer sheathing of the coax and it pays dividends to actually insert a line isolator at the transceiver end. That stops that noise getting down. It stops any residual RF being picked up from the coax going to the transceiver, and it makes for a very clean connection. Perhaps I should also mention the end fed half wave. How do you treat that? Well, despite what many people say, the end fed half wave doesn't need a counterpoise, although it does need a short pigtail it needs a 0.05 wavelength of uh, bare coax, or not bare coax, but a 0.05 um, length of coax before you attach the uh, line isolator. In other words, you've got the end of the uh, end fed half wave going into the 49 to 1 transformer. You allow 0.05 of wavelength of coax at the lowest frequency, then you insert a line isolator, then you take your coax back to the transceiver, and then I also insert another line isolator there. So that takes care of your end fed half wave. So that's uh, the line isolator. It's one you can make easily, it's very effective. Um, I've used it uh, on all bands from 40 meters to 10 meters. Um, I believe it will also be effective on 8 meters, although I don't operate on 8 meters, but I see no reason why it shouldn't be. Um, based on the uh, inductance and, and so forth and the calculation that uh, results from that uh, that winding. So 
I hope it's helped you. I hope it's given you a guide and I hope it answers the questions that many of you asked about various points about line, iso line isolators, whether you should use one, where you should put it, etc, etc. Very easy to make. You can, of course, simply call up your coax feed round a ferrite core if you're using something like RG58. But the beauty of making a independent separate line isolator is it makes it portable. You can plug it in wherever you like and uh, it's not overly expensive. So there we are. As usual, thank you for watching this video. Thank you for your support on this channel. It's much appreciated. And also thank you for the support uh, at the, uh, the shop. Um, we carry a wide range of products and we carry all the major items, of course. We carry all the Yesu uh, and Icon transceivers, as well as all the accessories. And we carry loads and loads of um, other accessories, bibs and bobs, plugs, sockets, coax cable, which we've covered in this video. And we also uh, now stock the Messi Poloni coax, which is very good, particularly for VHF and UHF operation. So in the meantime, you enjoy your home radio, you take care, and as usual, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.